But like, <laughs> there's one point in the in the graphic novel where you know she's introduced to all the members and you know, like young Neil. She's like, oh, what do you play? He's like, oh, I don't I don't play anything. I just live here. And she goes, oh, <laughs> and it like kills him. He's like, oh. <laughs> well, now my friends, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna move on to the next part of my show, and that is comic book corner. And for today's comic book corner, I will be reviewing Scott Pilgrim Volume 1, Scott Pilgrim's Precious Little Life. And the person I have to thank for this particular review today is Chris Ayers. Chris Ayers, thank you so much for suggesting it for the comic book corner poll. And thank you to everyone for your other suggestions and for voting for this book. Um... You know, to start off, chat, I want to provide you with a bit of a synopsis and history and, and background for uh, Scott Pilgrim, the, the series that is. You know, originally it was published uh, between 2004 and 2010, and the graphic novel series is the creation of Canadian author and artist Brian Lee O'Malley and follows a 23-year-old slacker and musician Scott Pilgrim as he falls in love with a delivery girl named Ramona Flowers in Toronto, Canada, where he must defeat her seven evil exes in order to keep dating her. Uh, there are currently six published volumes available right now, both available in black and white uh, and colored editions. Originally published in black and white, but then now, chat, you can find colored editions uh, everywhere and also online. So it makes it very, very convenient. And before kind of jumping into my opinions on, on the first, you know, volume of, of Scott Pilgrim, you know, uh, Scott Pilgrim's pr precious little life, that is, uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, the, the history, the, the, the legacy, and also the many adaptations of Scott Pilgrim over the last decade, chat. You know, though it's been about, I guess, like I said, though it's been about a decade at this point, uh, I, I don't recall knowing too much about Scott Pilgrim until the release of the Edgar Wright film in, in 2010, uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the, the World, which, which condensed all six volumes into uh, one, one movie. Um, I might have seen the, the, the books or their artwork featured, you know, at bookstores or comic shops or even, even online, you know, as memes and things, um, and GIFs. But I don't have any specific memory uh, in, in which I knew about the series before the release of the movie. It was always that thing in the background. It was like, oh, yeah, yeah. It was a part of the aesthetic. It was the, a part of the aesthetic of the store or whatever online community that I was a part of. And maybe I'm like, oh, yeah, it's from Scott Pilgrim something, you know? It wasn't, it wasn't really on my, on my radar. Not dismissing it, again. You know, I've, I've read a lot of comics, a lot of graphic novels back in the day. It's kind of overwhelming. I mean, you're, you're inevitably going to miss something and skip something uh, by, by accident, no matter how uh, beloved or, or, or popular, you know, it is. And the one thing I will say, you know, I was a huge fan of, of the film. And it was one of my favorites of, of 2010 or, what, or whatever year it, it, it came out. You know, I was I was very sad that it 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 wasn't a uh, commercial success. Matter of fact, it was like a commercial box office bomb. But you know, I'm happy to see it find you know a new audience uh, years later, and you know it's since become a huge cult classic uh, o o over time. And uh, you know, I read a little bit of of the first volume y years ago when I was in in college. You know, after the film had had come out, and I was like, "Oh wow, this this is this is great," um, but I was I was just so busy with with school that eventually I just I just dropped it, and you know I never went never went back to it, and that, that's not because I didn't like it. I I did actually like it. I was again I was just too too busy, you know, during that time. I was just a stressed out college kid, and then after my you know I finished my undergraduate degree, I went into my master's degree chat, and that's when I really started to kind of fall off of comics just in general. I just wasn't I just wasn't keeping up, and so it, again I started reading at a very inconvenient time. Not the fault of the work at all. It was my fault. I'm to blame. But you know, since that time, uh, the, the the series has con continued to permeate uh, through pop culture. You know, reference in numerous genre content, uh, a video game adaptation, a beat 'em up, I believe, and now an upcoming Netflix series, which is going to adapt all six volumes. At least, you know, that's probably what they want to do, chap. But they're going to adapt the the actual graphic novel series. And what's so cool about that? Um, they're going to bring in 
most, if not all, the uh, of the uh, live action actors that that played those characters uh, in the in for the series. Everyone from you know Michael Sarah to Mary Elizabeth Winstead and and Karen Culkin. So I think I think that's pretty cool. I'm I'm very I'm very happy for that um, because you know again you know I was I was a huge fan of that movie and I couldn't you know obviously I couldn't compare it to the book at the time or the the series because I hadn't read it but. Based on what I saw, I was like, oh, wow, they, they did a, you know, it's like, wow, they condensed that much material into into one movie. And, you know, seemingly it seemed to work. You know, I did hear, I, I, I will say this, two things. Um, I did hear from fans of the series that they felt like Edgar Wright had left out a lot of material. And, um, you know, even reading this first volume, there, there is some stuff that I can see that he, he did left out because he just had to. I mean, for the sake of convenience and for time and things, you can't have a six-hour, you know, long movie, right? And um, the other criticism that I heard consistently, and again, I had nothing to compare it to, is that they some people just didn't jive with the casting. I know a big thing was like Michael Sarah as as Scott Pilgrim. A lot of people thought he was he was he was too old for the role. Um, a lot of people said he his in terms of how he was presented, he was a lot more sympathetic in the movie than he was in, in the book. But, you know, again, I, I had nothing to compare it to. And I thought, I thought all the actors, you know, there was no one in the movie that I thought was, did a bad job. I thought, oh, they're all, everything seems like, you know, really fun. They seem like they're having a great time. And I can, I can, you know, I understand like the, that movie might not be for everybody. You know, it has a lot of niche sensibilities, indie sensibilities. It's weird. It's weird. It incorporates a lot of video game aesthetic like classic arcade video game aesthetics and for an audience that just hasn't been exposed to that kind of they'll be like what the hell's going on I'm confused you know and all that's also from obviously you know the the, the graphic novel series as well it's even at the time it was it was like kind of a initially initially when it you know first star when when um uh, O'Malley was trying to publish this work you know it was very indie kind of underground almost but you know it was hard to kind of penetrate the the mainstream and, and sadly it failed um to do that and again not the film's fault you know um but I'm, I'm very happy that it has continued to be successful post its initial release. Because I really do think it's a great movie. I think it's a very funny comedy. You know, um, well, it's certainly one of my favorite comedies of, of, the, of the 2010s. And for me, you know, some people might, might feel differently. I think it's probably Edgar Wright's last truly great film. Um, you know, I didn't care for The World's End at all. I didn't, I really didn't like Baby Driver. And I, I liked, I, th I think... Um, Last Night in Soho is probably his best movie since uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Um, you know, there's great performances, wonderful last performance uh, by by Diana Rigg, by the way. But there's certain things that didn't really work for me, you know. And I, I've done a review for that. I've done a spoiler review for that. You can check out that content, of course. Not turning this into an Edgar Wright discussion, Edgar Wright review in his in his filmography. But 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 again, I just want to say that I think that movie was great, and I think Edgar Wright did a really good job adapting material. It's probably my favorite film of his, you know. Um, you know, in, in quite some time outside of obviously Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, which are like two of my favorite comedies of all time. Now, you know, for, for this for this particular volume, uh, which which, by the way, is, is a fully colored edition that that's what I read. You know, the original how this was originally published was in 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 black and white. And that's still you can still find those. You can find those online. Uh, you can you can buy those. But if you want the colored edition, go and check that out. I recommend it. Actually, the colors are quite beautiful in the book. But in any case, you know, I, I really appreciated uh, in this particular edition, that O'Malley included a lot of extra material about the creation of the series. You know, he used so much of his own childhood and upbringing and, and experiences as, as a young man uh, in, in this book. You know, he, he practically says, you know, in the extra uh, materials that, that like Scott Pilgrim, you know, his, his friends and, and world are all inspired by uh, actual, you know, uh, events uh, from, from his life, you know, living in Ontario, Canada. You know, and also I think, you know, he, he's even made it himself. A lot of Scott Pilgrim is Brian Lee o O'Malley. And in this particular edition that I read, he also includes this a lot of photos and, and notes from just years ago, you know, stuff from the, the late 90s into the early 2000s, you know, pictures of things that inspired Scott Pilgrim's old house. You can find that, like the actual one that he, he used. It's like, oh, wow, it looks exactly like that. His, his apartment that he shares with Wallace, which he goes into detail, but I was like, I just found this weird building with this door, this underground looking apartment that's connected to a grocery store. It's like, this is where, this is where Scott Pilgrim and like Wallace lives. I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Like, you know, actual physical... 
uh, locations. And then even the, the posters of the bands he used to like hang out with when he was a kid, you know, growing up in Canada, like, you know, he would go to all these, again, the craziest names in the world, which he then would take his inspiration and change, obviously, for the sake of the book, doesn't want to steal those names. But then you could tell like, oh, yeah, that it came directly from that indie rock, punk rock, you know, scene that he was a part of when he was a kid and a teenager and, 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 and you know, eventually as a, as a, as a young man. Um, and all that reference, all that reference material is is presented in a very fun, engaging way. You know, just plenty of humor and insight in his creative process. A lot of honesty, and again, the kind of that self-deprecating humor that you know permeates through the the rest of the, the book. So, I I recommend. I read it via I read the volume one via Comicology. You know, and but I'm sure you can buy the physical edition like anywhere at any comic book store, any bookstore that you go to, and and it includes that material as as well. But I, I really like that. It, you know, it provided a lot more context. It's like, oh, it's, it's always kind of cool to, I love behind the scenes stuff. And it's like, hey, this is what, you see this thing that in this book, you know, it kind of like has a special, you know, um, place in like uh, for, for a character, you know. I was like, well, it's a special place for the author. That's where it originally came from. So stuff like that I think is great. And, that, and, and this particular volume that I read contains that. Um, the thing is, though, you know, when the book was originally released, it was not a success. It was not a commercial success. And O'Malley was basically destitute and had to get like a day job uh, to support himself while also working on the, the future volumes in the meantime. You know, his, his dream, this is so funny, he goes into the extra materials I was talking about. His dream was to have the first volume sell 1,000 copies. He's like, once I sell 1,000 copies, I know I'll make it. I'll be able to support myself, be able to pay rent, everything. I thought, oh, that's great. And, of course, eventually, as he you know, details later on, the series picked up in sales during the release of the second, and in particular the third volume, which I think is uh, is considered to be the best or one of the most well liked volumes, and sold millions of 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 copies, and you know has turned to a huge critical and commercial su success form, and it continues to be successful you know to this uh, to this day, and then you know moving on from the the, the history and legacy of the book, uh, I, I want to talk about the the first volume story, and and art. You know, though, though I am not like a, a manga reader, you know, this series certainly has the aesthetics and presentation sensibilities of, you know, of a manga, uh, which O'Malley has even said uh, was, was an influence for him since he used to grow up reading manga all the time. You know, initially the, the, the series, like I said, was in black and white like most manga. Uh, and the I have to say, like the character designs, you know, I would describe them as being like very friendly looking, kind of bubbly and just, you know, just cartoony. You could almost kind of see, like, I wonder, I do wonder if, if like, his artwork might have inspired other artists uh, who eventually went on to make, like, you know, cartoons, like, uh, either, you know, like, Adventure Time or even, like, stuff like Steven Universe. Like, I can kind of see that the designs are, like, very, very similar uh, to each other. So he might have, you know, been a, a part of, of a, a proliferation of a specific type of artwork that we later saw consistently in animated form in the late 2010s and, or excuse me, in, in, the, in the late 2000s and into the late 2010s. But I, I, I really do like the design. I think the designs just add, you know, to the book's, you know, sense of humor and kind of that consistent self-deprecating narrative that permeates yeah, throughout it. You know, and I also think that you know it's very easy to identify with many of, of these characters. And there, there there are a lot of characters in the book, but there's about like six or seven that I wanted to like talk about in in detail. Obviously, we, we should start with you know Scott Pilgrim, who is yes this 23 year old slacker, uh, who is like this part time musician, uh, who's just kind of you know going through life listlessly, you know. And he, you know, recently got a, a girlfriend, a high school girlfriend, which everyone has issues with, a, a 17 year old. They always say it like she's 16. He's like, no, she's 17. It's like at that point, man, doesn't matter. <laughs> knives, knives, chow. And listen, you know, uh, one thing I've noticed, like reading this first volume, and I can kind of understand why some people might not have liked the performance of, of Michael Sarah in the movie. And it's because Michael Sears' performance is like, yeah, he's, yes, he's, 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 you know, um, he's obviously, you know, dysfunctional 
and uh, doesn't seem to know what he wants to do in his life and everything. He makes some poor choices. But there's still something just sympathetic about him. You still, you still like him despite that. Here, Scott Pilgrim's a dick. <laughs> He's, he's, it's like, he, there's a, there's a bit of like a charm, but it's like a dickish charm throughout, throughout the book. And you can kind of see like all of his friends just kind of tolerate him, you know, and, and his, and his antics and the various things that he does, or in the, in the case of the, like this particular volume does, does not do. And so I can kind of see that, you know, like, oh, okay, maybe that's why some people had, maybe not issues with like Michael Sarah's casting. I mean, I know that there's. People that just hate Michael Cera for the sake of hating Michael Cera. I think he's a talented actor. Um, but, you know, in his performance, I almost, it almost felt like maybe Edgar was telling him, like, yeah, no, be, be, you know, be kinder. You know, he, it's almost, he softened the character. I think he definitely softened the character. And here, he's very much a dick. <laughs> that, that, that happens to be, you know, the, the main protagonist that we, that we follow. He's incredibly flawed. Uh, but that also makes it like endlessly entertaining, you know, to read because then it's like, oh, when people like mock him or make fun of him, you're kind of like, yeah, no, he, he, he definitely deserves it because, you know, he's not confronting his problems, you know, head on in this, you know, he has that, like all the characters have like this, you know, form of self-deprecating humor and he uses it the most and he almost uses it as an excuse for his behavior, right? It's like, well, I'm talking shit about myself, so therefore I can continue to be shitty, right? And I think, you know, that, that, I think that's interesting you know, uh, for, for the story itself. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, that, that's, you still have this problem you're not addressing it in, in, in a healthy way. And that's clearly what, you know, the other characters are pointing out in the story itself. And that's clearly what, you know, O'Malley is, is, is pointing out as, 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 as well, you know, through, through, through those characters and through his, his, his narrative. And especially in regards to, you know, the character of, of Knives Chow, which I gotta say, um... I will, right now, like, the Knives Chow character in the book, I think is a lot better than the one in the movie. You know, here, one, she's just adorable. She really is just adorable in the book. And I feel like she gets, you know, she has, like, a little more self-confidence. And, I, you know, how she's being manipulated by Scott is, like, kind of infuriated me uh, uh, to, to an extent. But she seems to be almost, like, more well put together. We, we get, we get a, a better sense of, of who she is and her family, and her, and her upbringing, like in the movie, and again, I think the actress did a good job, but after reading the book, I'm kind of like, yeah, no, I feel like they didn't do as much as they could have with, with the Knives Chow character, she's kind of, like, later on in the movie, kind of relegated to be kind of crazy, you know, just kind of like, you know, a, a Klingon crazy person, and, and like shy, like she's shy here, but not in the constant awkward shyness, and kind of weirdo shyness that we see in the movie, here she she feels like more put together and like more in control of of her life. It's just that you know she happens to have her first boyfriend and and you know there's that awkwardness period and then she's like really opening her. She's like I get the sense that she's opening herself up to him in a, in a in um in a more realistic way. Whereas in the movie, I felt like it was a little almost. I I know it's say over the top. It's like Chris, this book is over the top. It's like yes, but the the character here I think is treated more seriously. And I actually really like that about her. And because before in the movie, it's like, oh, yeah, she's that goofy, you know, crazy girl that, you know, Scott's cheating on or whatever. It's like, that's not good and, and everything. But she's kind of also forgotten in, in the movie after, after a while. And she only pops up, you know, a couple times, you know, after the, after the first act because she's so jealous of, um, of Ramona. But I have to say, like, I really like Knife Show. Also, uh, how she's introduced is very different than how she's introduced in the movie. Because I guess, like, you know, Scott in the movie, it's been a while since I've seen it, but he's just kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm dating this girl, Knives Chow. We don't really see, like, Knives Chow family or anything. Here, that's how we're introduced to her, actually, is, like, Scott's telling the story how he first met her on the bus, and, like, Knives Chow has this, oh, I mean, very strict, kind of almost stereotypical Asian Chinese mother. <laughs> And listen, you know, Brian O'Malley, he is Asian, <laughs> and I just feel like he 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 got like the cadence down right for like you know a, a you know a Chinese family that has emigrated to the United States and like certain things that like how they say it's like at one point in the book I found very amusing like you know as the bus like moves or shakes she drops her books on the on the floor of the bus and the mother goes you drop book on floor and it's almost kind of like. <laughs> It's like, ooh, but, but it makes sense because that's what he grew up with. That's what his, his older, you know, Asian relatives probably said and sounded like. And, and I, just, I just love kind of just the matter-of-fact way, like, the mom, like, was speaking in that, in that, 
in that bit of the of the graphic novel. I found it very amusing. But I like I really like Knives. I was I was actually surprised. I was like, when I was like, oh, okay, here we go, Knives. I don't like I want to get to Ramona, you know, obviously because I really like the Ramona character from the movie, Mary Elizabeth Winston, and everything. But I was taken aback by how much I was really charmed by her character. And it's not like because she's this, you know you know, cutesy, manic, pixie girl. That's not, maybe that's how she's portrayed later on in the volumes. I don't know. You know, it's kind of how she's portrayed in the, in the rest of the movie. But here, I kind of like that she's a little more grounded and has a little more uh, control over her life. She might devolve later on in the book for all I know. But I, I really, really liked what they did with Knives, Knives Chow. I, I was actually surprised how much I liked I was like, yeah, let's get to more Knives Chow stuff. I thought she was very charming. And then, of course, we have, you know, Ramona Flowers, which, uh, much like how she is in the, in, the, in the movie, you know, there's a lot of mystery surrounding her, uh, obviously. We don't get too much detail. Obviously, you know, Scott uh, first um, starts seeing her in his dreams, and they kind of explain in the graphic novel that, that you know, because she's American, that she can access, like, this, uh, I forget what they say, like, this, this basically this parallel universe to to travel from place to place because she's like a delivery girl for Amazon. I love it too because it's also dated. I it's so funny because in in the graphic novel, Scott's like talking to uh, Wallace Wells, who I want to talk about in a bit, and he's like, "What's that? What's that book, sir? What's that place that like sells books online?" He's like, "Amazon," and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, Amazon, yeah, that place." And now it's like like however many years years later, fifteen years, I guess, from you know more than fifteen years, she almost almost twenty years now, Jesus. Almost 20 years since this uh, graphic novel was first published, and just to see Amazon grow into the monolith that it is now. <laughs> it was like, oh yeah, it's that online company that sells books, whatever. It's like, oh, I heard they're starting to sell CDs now. It's like, oh, I'll buy some CDs, because Scott doesn't like to read books. So this a little, like, little aside there, it's like, oh my god, it's so funny. That little dated aspect. Again, timely for when it was made. Super timely for when it, when it originally came out. But then, like, wow, look what, look what Amazon is. Now it dominates, like, so much of our, our lives and our, our viewing habits, our reading habits, our listening habits and, and, and things. Um, I mean, grocery habits, food habits, everything. You know, it's kind of amazing. But, um, you know, she's a delivery girl, and she acts as, like, basically this parallel dimension. And, and she every time she does that, she keeps getting into Scott's dreams. And he becomes kind of obsessed over her. Um. There's not a lot, you know, she has like a cool attitude. She definitely has a cool attitude in this first volume. And I mean, when, in, the, in the graphic novel, the colored version, she just stands out. She's the, she has the most distinct look out of, out of everyone. Just, you know, obviously the, her constantly changing hair color, at least not in this one. It's, you know, it's pink, pur pink, pink uh, uh, purplish pink in, in this. But just her outfit, you know, the rollerblades and everything like that. And she's kind of like a bit of a fish out of water moving from New York to, to Canada and, you know, hanging out with Scott and kind of going back and forth. Like, there's a, there's a lot of charm to their conversation, but there is a sense of mystery, which I think is on purpose because, you know, we don't know about the seven evil exes through most of the graphic novel one because Scott always ignores it, <laughs> which is very amusing. But, you know, there's like, you know, she's that mysterious new girl that, you know, Scott's just obsessed with. So we don't get a lot with her in this particular book. It's more focused on kind of the personalities of the other characters, in my opinion. And like, I think Knives Chow gets like more development than Ramona Flowers. You know, we, we also get that scene, which I think is a very cute uh, scene, even though it's kind of shitty because Scott's dating Knives at the time. And where after they, they, you know, they basically have their first date, where it's pretty much, you know, uh, the date where it's like, yeah, we're just gonna go hang out in the park and like walk around, which actually probably is a good first date, to be honest with you, chat. Like, I've always said that, you know, people are like, well, what should I do for my first, I've gotten some people asking me in the chat, you know, it's like, oh, what, what should we do for our first date? You know, go to the movie, it's like, no, don't go to a movie, don't go to a movie, go to a place where you're gonna talk a lot, like have dinner, that kind of thing, go for a long walk, that's what you need to do. Um, and that's what they kind of do in this, where they're hanging out at the park and they're swinging and they're goofing off and stuff. And, and, the, and the dialogue, I think, is, is very charming. It's very, you know, hipsterish dialogue. So that might be a turnoff to some people. But again, that's, that's what this book is about. It's about these kind of indie punk rock, you know, hipsters. Uh, but then after that, you know, they go back, they go to her house and we get that scene where she's doing all the teas. And she's like, what kind of tea you want? He's like, I thought there's only one tea. And she goes through the whole list, you know, blueberry, raspberry, you know, uh, the, the apple, lemon, everything, Earl Grey. And he's like, um, the, 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 you, you pick. <laughs> and so very charming. You get to that one scene where she goes to get changed the bedroom and he goes in there. She's like, dude, I'm changing. He's like, oh. And then like, you know, he's like, I'm sorry. And he closes his eyes. And because she said, I'm going to get you a blanket. And then, you know, she walks up to him. And he doesn't know. He's like, how does that feel? He's like, oh, it feels warm. And then she's like hugging him. It's like, oh, it's really, it's really cute. It's really cute. 
And he's like, maybe we should go in the bed. She's like, yeah, I think so. And they're like, they're about to start stupping. They're about to have in sex chat. But then he gets a little nervous and she tells, you know what? I don't want to have sex with you. Uh, I just, I really like you though. And I just want to cuddle. And I was like, oh, that's not that cute. Just some cuddles. And so I thought that scene was, you know, very, very charming. And it's pretty much like from the movie. I mean, it's, it's word for word from the, from the book. You know, I mean, it's lifted right off the, uh, uh, off the page. Then the book it's handled very well, and so I like Ramona. She's she's got a lot of personality. There is a charm to her, but there's we still we don't know a lot about her, obviously. You know, because there has to be a sense of mystery to her and the seven evil actors. But I liked her. I liked her in the book. And then we get to like the the other you know main supporting cast. I would say everyone from Wallace Wells, to Stephen Stills, Kim Pine, Young Neil. You know, Wallace Wells is uh, Scott's uh, the gay boyfriend. Not gay boyfriend. <laughs> Although some, some people actually joke about that in the book. They call him his gay boyfriend. He's like, no, he's my gay roommate. Um, and he's great. And they, they live in that just basement, under, under dweller apartment, which just makes me think it's so cold. Uh, I like how his introduction is there, and he already knows. He's like, he's kind of already tired of, of Scott's shit and his whole shtick, but he just, he's like, ah, you're here, what can I do, it's like, Wallace pays for everything, you know, they have the, this, this great series of panels, which you also see in the movie, uh, where it, it highlights certain items, all, like, the main items, like, in the apartment, this little shitty, dinky apartment, and they're all owned by Wallace, of a side, like, the only thing that I think Scott owns is, like, it just has, like, this one line, this one block of text that says, random Scott shit. Like, it's like some clothes and Scott stuff. That's all it says. <laughs> and I thought that was very amusing. And uh, and then even, like, when they go to, like, it, it pans over, and, like, it continues on, and we see Scott, and, like, half of his outfit is stuff that Wallace owns. <laughs> like, they say that's, that's Wallace's socks, those are Wallace's shoes, that may or may not be Wallace's T-shirt. I'm thinking, oh, that, that's pretty funny. But he's great. He's just so charming, you know, and he's, despite his surroundings, you know, he definitely seems to have more of his life put together uh, than, than, than Scott does and, you know, gives him a lot of grief for it. He's kind of like, you know, uh, providing him the wisdom that he needs, but he's just not listening to at all, especially in regards to Knives and, uh, and Ramona and how he's insisting that break up with your high school girlfriend, okay, if you want to have a serious relationship with Ramona. He's like, I don't want to blurg, blurg, blurg and everything. Um, he, he's great. I love that he's just stealing boyfriends from people. Just, that's randomly. I think that's super funny. Like, we introduced the Scott sister, who doesn't really get a lot of scenes in this, much like the movie, played by Andrew Kendrick originally. I forget what her name is, uh, in the, in, in the film. Uh, or excuse me, in the, um, in the book. Uh, but, like, you have that whole scene where, you know, she's basically introducing her new boyfriend to everybody, and Wallace is just like, hey, and just steals him. <laughs> like, not even, not even at the very end of the book, it's just like a couple panels later, it's like, already, it's like, she's like, dude, stop stealing my boyfriend. So, I imagine that's going to be like a recurring gag throughout the, the later, uh, the, you know, the, the later volumes. Uh, but then you have, like, his bandmates, like, Stephen Stills, who they all insist on calling, like, you know, even Knives is like, do you always say his first and last name? She, he's like, what you mean? Who do you mean? Steven Stills? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we always call him Steven Stills, which I don't know. I mean, it's a good name. It's a good name, Chad. I, I like it. I like it uh, uh, quite a bit. It has a nice ring to it. Just Steven. We know a lot of Stevens in our life. Steve, Stevens, Stephans, but Steven Stills, it stands out. So I can see why he insists on his, on his last name also being said. And he's like the only member of the band that actually like takes it seriously. Like he wants to have like a music career for sex bomb right? He's actually, like, you know, uh, pretty good. Everyone else is kind of like, eh. Except for, oh, but then you have Kim Pine. Kim Pine, who, you know, we, we I, did we learn this? Yeah, I think, you know, former girlfriend of, of Scott Pilgrim, and uh, she just has, like, this totally cool just attitude. Again, she's also this one, like, she's dated Scott, she knows Scott, and she's like, I'm tired of your shit and your shtick. You know, she's still on somewhat friendly terms with him, to whatever degree you can be, with, with after, you know, he kind of probably backstabs you, <laughs> treats you like shit. Uh, but you know her every time they they have her on and you know she's got she has like this really just biting dialogue that I find like very very uh funny um and I found her very charming and then you have young Neil who I know I know that he grows you know in the rest of the series but he's just he's just this guy that's constantly put upon like I think when he's like even first introduced like to Knives Knives, you know, who obviously is charmed by the band. And she's not like, wow! She's not like, again, I feel like it, she's too exaggerated in the movie. Here, it's just like, wow, you guys are really good. But it's not like, like, blah, 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 like you know, crazy, right? She's not a maniac like she is, I think, in the film. 
Um, yeah, but again, I, I, but still good, still good. But like, <laughs> there's one point in the in the graphic novel where you know she's introduced to all the members and you know, like young Neil. She's like, oh, what do you play? He's like, oh, I don't, I don't play anything. I just live here. And she goes, oh, <laughs> and it like kills him. He's like, oh. <laughs> And he's definitely the character that I feel like is just kind of bullied and and put upon throughout the throughout the book. He's always fucking crying half the goddamn time, which I found very amusing. But I imagine he'll have some significant growth uh, later on. And then, of course, you know, you get to the first evil ex, which, oh, much like in the movie, like, um, oh God, uh, what's the, what's the first um, Patel? Matty, Ma Matthew Patel, Matthew Patel is, is the first of the evil exes, and it's like this recurring gag in the graphic novel where he's constantly trying to contact Scott after Scott, you know, somehow it's, it's just known that he's interested in Ramona, and he's like, sends him an email, Scott, he kind of goes over, he's like, whatever, I'm bored, <laughs> and then like letter, he gives him like a letter, he's like, whatever, I'm bored, he doesn't care, until he finally uh, confronts him, we get his whole back, not a lot, you know, with, with, with this guy, but you get the whole backstory where, you know, he dated Ramona, I think what in middle school or for like a week and a half. And that was only because all the jocks were obsessed with her for whatever reason. She's smoking cigarettes, smoking cigarettes, thought she was all punk rock and badass. And they used their combined powers to fight off all the football jocks and all the other sports player jocks and playing their sports balls. Right. And then, um, it didn't really last that very long, but he's still, he's like, you horrible wench, <laughs> you broke me, you betrayed me. And he's very funny. He's got his sexy, uh, like Indian, kind of like Bollywood vampire goth girls or whatever that he summons for the battles. And also, I liked I liked the extended battle. So they did change it in the in the movie. They they definitely shortened it. But the rest of his bandmates in the graphic novel they join him in the battle and they're singing this song the entire like they do a little bit of the song in the, in the in the movie. But there's much more of a longer song here, and I really like it. We get to see like more of their crazy abilities. And they also all say like, "Oh yeah, no, Scott, he's like he's the dick, but he's like the greatest uh, mixed martial artist in in Toronto, Canada." <laughs> They even say that. It's like, oh, no, he's actually, they even say, like, no, he's, he was great. Like, they even say that he took, like, classes for various uh, forms of combat. And I forget if it's swordsmanship or something or fencing. And they say that he's, like, really good at it. He's like, yeah, he's actually really good at that. Which is like, why don't you be, like, a mixed martial artist than Scott? Because he's lazy. <laughs> Can't help himself. Um, he ends up, you know, of course, defeating him in the, in the graphic novel, gets some coins, not enough even for change to take, to take the, the bus home, but then it kind of wraps up and it ends with him and Fiona spending more time after he just fucking abandons knives, which is like, fuck you, dude. Knives is adorable. Don't treat her that way. And, um, she reveals everything to him, you know, setting up the, the, the seven evil exes. He's like, ex-boyfriend? She's like, no, evil exes, because we know why. <laughs> we, I, I do know why, but it's funny. She's like, what do you mean evil exes? You mean evil ex-boyfriends? He's like, no, evil exes. It's like... No, because you know he has. She had a girlfriend at one point. She was experimenting. Uh, I think that was. I think that was pretty funny. And um, you know, he mentioned something that kind of takes her off guard, and she seemed like really distant. But then he's like, "Do you still want to date me?" He's like, "Yeah, dude." And they start just just sucking face, munching face the entire time. But it's a really charming book. It's a really charming book. I I, I kind of I you know now that I have more of a perspective. You know, that I have more context, you know, you know, now I can understand why people might, might have had some issues with the movie now. It's like, oh, I kind of get it. It's like, okay, I can see what you're saying. Because I do feel like there are certain characters that, and that's just because, you know, you, through this graphic novel form, you have more time to develop everybody. And I feel like they definitely have, that's what Brian O'Malley's doing. He's, he's developing a lot of these other supporting characters, and I'm getting a better sense of, you know, who they are as, 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 as people. Uh, particularly with, you know, obviously Scott, who's much more of a dick in this, and also with the character of, um, of Knives Chow. But, you know, I think it's a wonderful piece of fiction that's a very easy read. Like, you know, I, I read this, I don't know, less, like an hour, hour and a half. Like, I just kept reading. I was like, oh, my God, and just looking at the artwork and stuff and reading all that. Like, it's, it's a super easy read, you know, and I think it will be certainly very relatable uh, to millennials <laughs> like myself like many of the, the people who are watching this live right now who are going to be watching on YouTube, you know, who feel like they have gone through many of the same things that these disaffected characters have, have gone through. Um, you know, reading this, this first volume makes me want to instantly, you know, pick up the next and see the misadventures of all these characters uh, continue on. And hey, it's all available on Comixology, so I think I might just do that along with Something is Killing the Children, which I've also done a review for and I also really enjoyed. Couldn't be more different from each other, but uh, great works. And this is a great work, too. 
I, I'm, I'm glad that this series took off for Brian Lee O'Malley and that he combined I mean, not only his experiences of his childhood. I mean, it's, it's a very, a very Canadian work of art. Very Canadian. Um, I even I recognize some of the stuff that they were talking about and referencing because I lived so close to Canada as a kid. I live in Buffalo, New York. I mean, it's really like a hop and skip over. And there I am in Toronto. So there's a lot of that that I even I could like attach myself to. I'm like, I see what they're doing, especially about the weather. They're always complaining about cold weather. It's like, yep, you're in Great Lakes. I understand what you're going through. Uh, but also how it incorporates stuff from like other forms of media that maybe Western audiences aren't too experienced with, like manga. I'm certainly not experienced with manga. Anime, yes, but not manga. And so this might also be kind of like a gateway to manga for people. I think that you can all, you, I think you might describe it that way. Obviously, there's, you know, certain things, aesthetics that, that are very different, you know, you know, reading, you know, left to right and reading right to left and stuff, of course. But, you know, it definitely has those, those sensibilities. And it's just a fun, it's just a fun story. It's just, it's just really funny and it's smartly written and it's got characters that you're going to care about and feel invested in. So highly recommend, highly recommend Scott Pilgrim, volume one, Scott Pilgrim's Precious Widow Wife. And of course, you know, the other Scott Pilgrim material that has, that has come out since then, the movie, which I still love, which I still think is fantastic. I wonder how I'll feel about it even more so after reading the rest of the volumes, though. I wonder if my perspective might change, because I kind of understand people's perspective now. But again, I highly recommend Scott Pilgrim Volume 1. I think it's a, a great piece of work and a, and a great graphic novel, great comic, and I think a lot of people will really enjoy it. But what about you guys? You know, what, have you guys read Scott Pilgrim Volume 1? If not, are you interested in seeing it? Have you um, consumed other Scott Pilgrim content in different mediums like the movie or the video game? Or, and are you excited for the upcoming Netflix series? Let me know.